People have been nervous. I'm not going to, no, listen, I got concerned. Our neighbors got concerned about what was taking place. Maybe God's going to use that to help us not just be concerned, but be praying. And so you pray about that, and um, praise the Lord. Let's all stand up and take our song, but we're going to sing a welcome chorus, one that we enjoy. We've been singing for a little while, and we still like it around here. Page 14, and it's always good to sing about heaven. I know I'm going. I am going to heaven. No doubt about it. Thank you, Jesus. Let's sing it out. Page 14. We'll sing the first verse, and then we'll get around and say hi to one another and shake hands. Well, you may ask me where I'm headed. You may ask me where I'm bound. Well, I'm going to a country across the sea. somebody. Amen.
Let's see that second verse. That second verse on page 14. Well, I'm going to a country. Let's sing it out for the Lord. Here we go now. Oh, well, I'm going to a country where they say we'll never die. To be endless joy glowing in for me. Yes, I know I'll live forever in the city and the sky. Oh, well, I'm out of the kingdom of the free. Sing it like you know it. Here we go. Yes, I'm out of the kingdom of the blessed and the free. And my Jesus is coming out to me. There is nothing to compare with the glory of the day. Yes, I'm out of the kingdom of the free. Amen. Great singing 223, but the cow's going to come up and lead us one more congregational song, 223. Oh, I love this song. Let's sing it with our heart. 223, draw me nearer. I am mine, O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it's all I love to be. But I want to rise in the arms of faith. And be closer, drawn to me. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Watch me on that course. Consecrate me now to Thy service, Lord, by Thy power of grace. With a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in mine. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the beauty, light of a single. Great singing for the Lord. And uh, in a moment, we're going well, to go to the Lord in prayer now. We've covered this time, one of our great moments. Uh, we're going to pray. And uh, I'm going to ask, we're honored to have uh, the Weaver family with us. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Weaver, if you'll come and pray for us, uh, of maybe two or three stanzas from the piano we'll play, and then you just come on up here and pray. And so we'll all pray quietly while the piano plays. And uh, we're honored to have them with us, and uh, we're excited to have them worship with us. And so you pray for us. And we're praying for many things. And, you know, the Bible says, call unto me and I will answer thee. I, I want you to believe that. I want you to believe in your heart that there's a God in heaven who hears and answers prayer. And one verse said, only believest. Wow. If we would just only believe... Only believe. And God help my unbelief. Amen? Amen? One man asked Jesus, he said, If thou will have compassion, 
And it's almost like the Lord was thinking, compassion, you got to be kidding me, I'm full of it. And so he turns it around and says, if you only believe. And see, there's the key. And so our God's compassionate. He's merciful, long-suffering, gracious towards us. And his bountiful store is so full. He's got so many blessings to hand you. Let's ask. And I'll close, I'll, uh, Brother Weaver will be coming up here and closing us out. Let's take some time with the Lord. thank you for the privilege to gather together. We thank you that we can go a lot of different places around this world and find people of like mind who are trying to accomplish the same things that we are. I thank you for the encouragement that it is to be here this morning and to know that there are people here seeking your will and seeking to get the gospel out. I ask that you continue to guide and direct Brother Greg as he leads this ministry. I pray that you would give him wisdom and understanding and discernment. I pray to be the needs that are represented here, each and every one of us have. I ask you to help us to trust you with those things and give us the grace and the strength that we need to accept your will to be accomplished in our lives. We pray for the property next door, especially, and all the different things that are going on and the decisions that need to be made regarding that. May your will be done. And we pray if it be your will that day we would be able to get this property. We pray that you be with those that are dealing with health difficulties, personal issues. Put your hand of healing where it's needed and a hand of encouragement in those who need it. And continue to lead and guide in our lives. Be with the service today. Help us to continue to honor you in the things we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all stand up and take the word of God. And uh, before the Bible... Psalm 48, 1 and 2. And so it's right in the Bible. Amen. It's nice to find that song like that. Psalm. It's in the middle of the book, the middle of the Bible. You might hit Proverbs. If you do, just go back and then find the 48th book of Psalm and verse 1 and 2. And then we'll call attention to the passage of the Bible message today. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. And it goes like this if you don't know it. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king? One more time. And great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth. Is 
as Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Amen. Take the word of God with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter number 11. We've been going through the book of Job. We have a commercial here. And I've enjoyed the book of Job. I hope you have too. First Corinthians chapter number 11. And we'll start in verse number 23. Of course, the book of Corinthians deals with a carnal church. But you know what? They were a thriving church. Sometimes we just look at them and say, oh, carnal church. Well, don't forget, they were in a ungodly city, and this church was booming. These people got saved and was growing. Unfortunately, the devil goes to the church that God shows up at, and he was at work and began to bring carnality to the individuals of the church. And when you have an individual that's carnal, the church becomes carnal, because churches are strong because of the church, people. And uh, we read in verse 23 to verse number 34, these verses. You read in your hearts as I read aloud. The Bible says, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whoso shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Heavenly Father, we come to thee now. I know that you don't have to have me, but I've got to have thee. And Lord, as your servant, I'm asking for your help. And may we see Jesus. As Hebrews said, but we see Jesus. May we see him high. May we see him with a good glimpse today. And encourage your hearts. I love you and I thank you so much for the precious price that was paid on Calvary. In Christ's beautiful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The book of Corinthians, a carnal church as I made mention, but they were a thriving church. They were getting carnal and because of the carnality they had a lot of problems. When carnality starts in your house and it trickles into the church, you get problems. They had confrontation. You had all these cliques joining up. You ever been to a church where there was cliques happening? And it's like, if you weren't with this clique, you weren't it. You know what I'm saying? you got to be in to be it. And uh, their cliques dealt more with the followers of their favorite preachers. It points it out. He said, some of Apollos and some of Paul, some of Peter. And uh, Peter, you know, when I think about Peter, I think he preached. He's the kind of preacher that probably, I mean, did a backflip when he preached, you know. A Billy Sunday kind of guy. If you've never heard of Billy Sunday, read about him. He was an evangelist back in the day, a baseball player, led the major leagues in stolen bases, and then he got saved. He was a drunkard, by the way. He got saved, and when he got saved, God used him. He became a preacher, and that man preached, and he was probably the most powerful revivalist. And um, America saw definitely in the 20th century. I mean, a powerful, powerful preacher. He would run and slide into the pulpit and then jump up and scream, Safe! in the arms of Jesus. And uh, he was, man, he was something else. Um, he would start preaching. I, I'm seeing Peter in this. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, he would start preaching, and he wore long john underwear underneath his outfit. Sometimes he would start taking off his clothes all the way down to his long johns while he's preaching. 
And he would be on a high platform. Thousands would gather to hear him preach. And there was people that were threatening him. No joke. One time while he was preaching, he thought a guy was pulling out a gun. He stopped preaching and jumped right on top of the guy. Who thinks Peter might have been like that? You know what I'm saying? Come on now. Big burly back Peter dragging that fish in there all the time. Always open his mouth up, you know. You got to, is that, who? You know. And, uh, but um, that was Billy's Sunday. Then he had Apollos. Apollos was the orator of the day. He was, dearly beloved, welcome to the house of God and take now with me the Bible. I mean, he could say just right. Probably had never messed up one stutter or nothing like that. Exegetical in his preaching and it was just so profound. And uh, I, I got tapes and I heard in person a few times the great Dr. Lee Robertson, what an orator he was. Great at preaching. His messages would just, you would hang on to the words. They'd just come out. You'd hang on each one of them and always like with boom, 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 boom. I could see that Apollos right there. Then they had the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, he was a preacher that was just deep in the doctrine. He wasn't well they looked upon. He didn't look that good. But man, when he preached, people hung on every word. And he was great in the word of God, a great soul winner. And he was deep in the deep things of God. That kind of preacher that you're going, whoo, I didn't know it said it like that. Wow! Well, I've been fed some meat today. And there are these cliques going on. You had other carnality that was trickling on through. After the cliques were going on, you had some that began to condone sin. They had outright sin happening in their church, fornication. And people were overlooking it. Matter of fact, he was a leader. One of the man, main men in this fornication was leading things in the church. And it was like they were okay in it because of who he is. You see how carnal they were? It wasn't good. And when that happens, then you get your worship service out of whack. You know, it's kind of hard to worship the Lord when you've got uh, uh, cliques going and, and I'm this and I'm that. And you've got uh, condoning of sin and overlooking problems in the church. And now the worship's a mess. God almost pretty much says it like this. It's better y'all stop having church here. He really cuts down to it and says, this, this Lord's Supper business, it's a mockery. You had people that were showing up just to eat. They would have the Lord's Supper and it's like, oh man, I'm hungry today. You know, church is having the Lord's Supper. Well, let's go help ourselves, you know. And uh, it was just an awful catastrophe taking place. We get here to a part of the Bible where the Apostle Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. Now today we're going to partake in it. We do it. Really, every first Sunday of the month, that's what God's touched our hearts with in the past two years. And I want to look at the Lord's Supper with you. Do you know why we have the Lord's Supper? Do you want to know, I mean, do you know the great pictures that the Lord's Supper has? Listen, this is life-changing. This is one of the great things that we partake in. I was sitting beside a Chinese lady who had just been saved. And she invited us to China. It was amazing. And we were in China, and we went to a church, and the Lord's Supper was coming up. And she said, I, I'm having a hard time with this, because it just makes me hurt thinking about the Lord. And I told her, I said, you know, it's not supposed to be a time of mourning over the Lord. It's supposed to be a time of rejoicing. We glory in the cross. We boast in the cross. The greatest emblem of my life is that one. That's the greatest thing going on in my world. It's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he went on the cross to die for me, a sinner, and paid my debt and rescued me from a devil's hell. Aren't you glad for the cross? Somebody say amen. Yeah. Amen. I like pictures of it. I like it when I see ladies have a necklace on it. I like walking in someone's house and there's a picture of the cross. What an emblem. What is something to boast about? And we don't have much to brag on. We've got that right there. That's the bragging place right there. The cross of the Lord Jesus. I am who I am today. You know how? By the grace of Jesus Christ. That's it. Right. That's it. Amen. I'd be down in some gutter. I'd be in some kind of trouble today. I'd be somebody's, uh oh, I'd be my dad and mama's broken heart if it had not been for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Thank God for Calvary. Amen. And we get here and Paul deals with the Lord's Supper because they're missing it. Boy, they're missing it. I want to show you the Lord's Supper. Now quickly, just to give a little educational understanding, we partake in the Lord's Supper. It's a church ordinance. This is something that Jesus Christ gave the church. 
And we know that because church ordinances picture two things. Number one, they picture salvation. Death, burial, and resurrection. And when, uh, not two, yeah, two things. Uh, let me say this. There's two things you've got to have to have a church ordinance. My apologies. Number one, it pictures salvation. Death, burial, and resurrection. The Lord's Supper does that. I'll show you in a moment. The second thing, in order to be church ordinance, it had to be given to the church, and Jesus did that. Now, some people wash feet, and uh, they want to do that. Help yourself, you know. That's their local church, but I do not believe the washing of the feet is a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. So that's why we do not have it. That's a little education for y'all. All right? Everybody good? And maybe you didn't want to see my feet anyways today. Can I get a witness? All right? I, like, I usually tell a joke right there, but my wife hates that foot joke, so I'm going to move on. But at least you know, you come ask me afterwards. I'll be glad to share. It's one of my favorites. She hates it, so we'll move on. But, um, oh, it's so close. I almost told it. Not going to. Not going to. It's good to have humor, but I can't be a comedian. Okay, so notice what the Bible says now in verse 22. He gets to the Lord's table right here. He says, For I have received of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, What I'm about to tell you is something that Jesus gave me personally. Now, the Apostle Paul was a true apostle indeed because he witnessed the Lord Jesus after the resurrection. That's a true testament of the Apostle era. And the Peter was one. He says, I received from the Lord the Lord's Supper. You might say, I don't think he was in the upper room. You're right. This was afterwards. Jesus met Paul, and uh, he had his own Bible college, just Jesus and him, and God taught Paul some things. Notice what he teaches us. Which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, notice this phrase, this is important to get a hold of, the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. It's not accidental that God starts out the Lord's table reminding us of the night of his betrayal. It was the night that Jesus was going to start doing the great task that he had been thinking about, yea, dreading even, the night of the betrayal when they're going to take the Lord Jesus and start down that path of crucifixion. Did you know Jesus had you on his mind that night? Did you know the great God of the ages, when he was going to become the Lamb of God, when he was going to take on the sins of the world, took time in an upper room to give us something so valuable and precious as a church, the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. Amen. Wow! He was thinking about me, and I'm talking about years down the road when the church, the Ponderosa of Baptist, would take the Lord's Supper. Jesus was thinking about us the night of his betrayal for us to remember the great sacrifice of his love to us. Man, that's amazing, isn't it? When I got hard times, sometimes I don't know what to think, but Jesus stayed the course and had you on his mind. And let me tell you this too. If he had you on his mind in that moment, he's got you on his mind in this moment. Jesus knows everything about you and Jesus loves you and Jesus cares about you. You can cast all your care upon him because he constantly cares for you. Isn't that a great thing? The night he was betrayed. Notice what it says. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. The next verse. After the same manner, he also took the cup, which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. In my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And then the next thing, verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, Ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now there's three things there we're going to look at. Three things that we're going to look at. Before I give them to you, pay attention to this. Usually this catches somebody's ear. Did you notice when we were reading that he said to make sure and take the Lord's Supper worthily and not unworthily? There are people that take the Lord's Supper and they're not at a worthy stage. What does that mean? And then he gave the consequences. He said some of them are sick. Did anybody get that? He said some of them are asleep. You know what that means? They're dead. What? 
Now, I don't believe that when they took the Lord's Supper, some of them were unworthy, and they took it, and they dropped over right there. But I believe some of them have been taking it in a carnal attitude, making a mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they went home, and then somebody got sick, and then somebody could not recover, and somebody went to the hospital, let's just act like it's today, and somebody could not get over the pneumonia, or something, 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 and they died. Or somebody got behind a car after they made mockery of the Lord's table the same night that he was betrayed. He loved you enough to make a holy ordinance and they made a mockery of it. And on the way home, a tire blew out. Something happened. Hey, listen, he said that there's people that are sick and yea, some of them asleep. I don't know about you, but that catches my attention. What does it mean to be worthy of the Lord's Supper? I'll tell you this, number one, of course, you've got to be saved. How can you have the Lord's Supper as a lost person? You've got to be saved. But really, it deals even more than that. Because notice the wording of God in verse 31. He said, For if you would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. The word judge means discern, try yourself. And then it says, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. That's what he says. He says, now, if, if you would just judge yourself before you take the Lord's Supper, you bypass all that chastisement. Because if you don't judge yourself, then it says, you'll be judged of the Lord. Am I listening? If you don't judge yourself, you'll get judged by God, and that chastening he'll do with you is to keep you from being condemned with the world. What does that mean? He says it like this. If you're going to make a mockery of the Lord's Supper and live carnal and act like a Christian and then go out here in the world and live like the world, God's going to deal with you. So you don't get wrapped up as a world person. Hey, Christians are to be different. Now what does that mean? Let me help you out. I do not believe that it means that during the Lord's Supper you're to be biting your fingernails to death. I hope I'm right with God. This is not a time of worry. You don't take the Lord's Supper in a worry form. That's ridiculous. You know if you're right with God. You say, well, have I confessed it all? Calm down. <laughs> it's not like that. God's not in heaven going, gotcha! Ha! <laughs> You thought you had confessed everything. Boy, are you sleeping the night. You know. Are you kidding me? Our merciful, gracious God, He knows we're sinners. He knows we're undone. He knows it's only by the grace of God. But He also knows this. He knows your heart. And if you are a hypocrite, if you are a faker, if you are rebellious in your heart, then you better not take the Lord's Supper. If you got sin in your life and you say, I'm not getting it right. Not that you're trying and you're messing up. There's a difference. Nobody's perfect. But if you're in here with a bit attitude against God. God, you preach how you want. I know what I'm doing. I ain't giving it up. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for that. That's called unworthily. And I'd be afraid to take the Lord's Supper as a believer in a worldly state like that. Now let's get to this point, and I'll give you the three points. Notice what it talks about. Here's where many people mess up. The Bible says in verse 29, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Did you hear that verse right there? Not discerning the Lord's body. Now listen to me. You know why people have a you know why people mess up? They're not thinking about Christ. Let me help you out, Christian. You get a good glimpse of that? You'll be glad to get it right. If you discern, if you judge, that's another word for judge. If you, if you will try and judge Christ on the cross, what the great God did for you out of love, you'll say, whew! All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. Boy, I'm crazy to want to live for myself. All He's done for me. Thank God for the cross. What do you want, Lord? It's yours. You want this? You got it. Boy, it's, well, I can't believe I was living like that. The thing that He went to the cross for me. 
Let's discern the body. Three things he wants us to see. Number one, and notice the key phrase in verse 24, it says remembrance. In verse 25, remember. And then verse 26, it says as often uh, it says, uh, as you eat this, uh, do show. So there's a remembrance in verse 26. So the key phrase is thinking of remembrance. Number one, remembrance of his broken body. His broken body. Maybe I ought to write this down. Number one, his broken body. The body of Christ was broken for you. What does it mean to have the bread break? Jesus, at the Lord's Supper, when he had his disciples beside them, and that night he took the bread and he broke it and handed it down to each one. And he said as he broke it, this is my body. This is my body. This is my body broken for you. You know what Christ wants you to know? That he broke his body for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Did I say the world? For God so loved the world. You want to put your name there? Help yourself. Aren't you? By the way, I'm glad he didn't say for God so loved Josh. You might think I'm crazy, but guess what? If he said for God, if I had a red jump, he said for God so loved Josh. I might think, well, which Josh is he talking about? But when he said world, I know, I, yes, he included me. For God so loved the world, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for you. Hey, discern the body. He broke his body for you. And when's the last time you got a good opportunity to think about the death of Christ for you? Hey, you would be on the cross if it wasn't for him. You say, would I really be on a physical cross? Let me help you out. You'd be in a devil's hell. A place of torment. A deep, the Bible calls it a bottomless pit. The Bible says it's dark. You ever been in somewhere so dark it just got creepy? You ever jumped in water? Now, where I grew up, we had lakes. I miss them. Okay, I'm in Arizona now. You know what I'm saying? We got like, you know small things here and there that come up when the winter comes. Uh, I grew up in lakes. And every now and then, Brother Kyle, you'd have crazy friends like, what you want to do, Dad, school? Let's go on that one cliff that's forbidden and jump off that rock. You know, them crazy guys. You've got like a, a narrow two feet spot. If we angle our bodies right off that 20 foot drop, we won't die and we'll hit the water right. You know, crazy friends of mine. And you know, sometimes you jump down there, you ever felt what it's like to jump in water and you're going down and you're, you know, waiting to touch and you don't and you kept going. Has anyone ever done that before? Oh, yeah. What finally comes to your mind? <gasps> I gotta get up. How far am I? It's creepy. Hell is dark. You can't see in front of your face. It's bottomless and it's hot fire. You know, the hottest fire that burns is black. Proven. Man, if he didn't die for me, if that body wasn't broken for me, that's where I'd be going for eternity. Right. A holy God. I'm unholy. You say, well, how, how bad am I? You're, listen, you're bad. Right. How good am I? I'll tell you how good you are. You're good enough to go to hell. Everybody in this room has sinned. If I was to take your mind and open it up and put it on a TV screen and we looked at what you have thought about in the last two weeks, you would beg me not to show it. You wouldn't want your mom, you wouldn't want your best friend, you wouldn't want your spouse to see the thoughts that have come through your mind in two weeks. You know what you are? You're undone. Right. The Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. Your best day on earth, you give me the best 24 hours you've ever lived. Everything you did that day, and you still weren't perfect. You still did something that was not right. If that is true, how in the world could we hold up our whole life to God thinking that we are worthy to escape the payment of sin? Everybody understands if you go out and break the law, there's a punishment. Don't you know God has law? And when the overall God of the universe who spoke the world into existence, when you break God's law, there's a punishment. The wages of sin is death. Wow. <laughs> you know what's crazy? We, get, we become loyal to all kinds of things on earth. 
Some people are loyal to rock and rollers. There's this some famous person, her name starts with an S, and she's got like a terminology for all her fans. You know what I'm saying? Swifties or something like that, you know. Anybody, what's it called, Swift? Someone help me. What's it called? I knew somebody would know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> who, who else knows? I was, I was hoping one of y'all would say, I was going to get you. I said, oh, thank you for knowing. I was going to get you, Brother Mark. Oh, boy, I was waiting. As a setup, you did good. You did good. Like, what is it? I have no idea. You know, people sell out for people. You, you find people that sell out for basketballs and footballs and become all engrossed in all these things of the world. But let me tell you something. No basketball died for me. No rock and roller died for me. Hey, nobody died for me but Jesus. Amen. His body was broken for me. You know, when you see bread tear, Jesus' body was torn for me. They ripped his beard off. They whipped him with a cat of nine tails, 39 stripes. Most people died at the whipping post. You could see intestines. They took him down to Golgotha, outside where all the trash heaps were and hung him between heaven and earth. Pierced him. His body was broken for me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one. All of us had turned our own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Man. With his stripes we are healed. His body was broken for me. Number two, not only his broken body, but remember when we take the Lord's Supper, his binding blood. Verse 25, After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. The New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. Jesus then took grape juice. Some people wonder, was an alcoholic? Alcohol is a sign of sin in the Bible. That's right. Jesus is sinless. Why would he give a picture of him being sinful? Grape juice is what it was. And Jesus said, With this is my blood. A picture of my binding blood. It didn't become blood. It was a picture. Just like this is a picture of me being married. If I didn't have it on, someone might meet me the first time and say, Oh, he's single. Oh, he's married. It's a picture of my faithfulness to my wife. How you doing? <laughs> and with that cup that he handed, it was a picture of of the binding promise sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ, this New Testament. Now what does that mean? See, in the Old Testament, when man sinned, God had a plan. And God in due time was going to send His darling Son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us. But in the Old Testament, it was not time for Jesus to come. And so God set up a way to point everyone to the cross. And that was by the shedding of the blood of animals. Do you remember in the garden, if you've read the passage of the garden, when sin came into the camp and Adam and Eve were hiding naked and God came and they tried to cover themselves with figs and stuff? What does the Bible say? It says that God took the coats of animals. How do you think he got that coat? An animal was killed. You, then you read the story of Abel and Enoch, and I'm sorry, Abel and Cain, and, and how Abel offered up a lamb, and Cain offered up the work of his hands. And, and you find in that story that Cain got angry and killed his brother, and Jesus actually brings him up like a martyr, so we understand that Cain and Abel were discussing salvation, and Abel was saying, hey, you know, uh, you understand that the, Jesus, uh, the, the lamb, and there was an argument that killed that took place it was the blood sacrifice that God was hammering down and you see sacrifices and then of course in the tabernacle with Moses and they began to shed the blood of animals and the high priest would walk once a year the remembrance of sin once a year and would shed the blood on the mercy seat the high priest and a picture of salvation and blood was being shed 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 you know what happened with Isaac and Abraham Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac and they went up on the mountain and before he killed his son Isaac, God spoke up or uh, Abraham spoke up after 
or before that, let me rewind. Before he took that up and God stayed his hand, the son asked, Abraham, son asked him, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. It was a picture of the Lamb of God. You know what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus Christ? Everybody listening? The first thing out of his mouth on that special day, behold the Lamb of God. And what was the Lamb of God going to do? Take away. That's the key. In the Old Testament, every sacrifice covered. It was an atonement. The word atonement means a covering. Covers can never wash. They just cover. And so all the sins of the world were only being covered. But when Jesus Christ came, the blood that was going to be shed, it was going to wash away sins. Amen. You know the emphasis all through the Bible, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Right. It's an amazing truth. It's amazing. Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb. John the Baptist looked up and said, Behold the Lamb. And then in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, John says, I looked for the lion, and in the midst was the lamb. I love that. Where is the lion? And guess who they saw? The lamb. Jesus Christ. It's his precious blood that was shed for you to give you salvation. That blood has given us eternal salvation. All my sins are gone. Washed white as snow. I don't carry the guilt of my sins. They're under the blood. I don't carry that past, that present, or future. It's under the blood. Hey, listen today. That right here is a picture of the binding blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That He died for you and He shed His blood for you. Now, let me help you out. We'll be done with that thought. Pay attention. How precious is that gift? To make the world it cost him his breath. To give you the Bible it cost him his breath. Are you listening? But to give you salvation it cost him a little bit more, didn't it? it? Cost him the blood. You always know how something is worth something by the price that was given. You might have a car worth ten bucks. That's worth nothing. You might have a car, if you pulled in here with a car worth 10 million, I think we'd all go outside and look at it. Someone would get a selfie by it. You know what I'm saying? This is amazing. Ch -ch 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 -ch. I saw on TV the other day a $20 million mansion. I was like, that's a lot of money. We were redeemed not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. Hey, can I ask you this? Look right here. Look right here, everybody. Let me ask you a convicting question. Have you discerned the body and blood of Jesus Christ recently? You know why people sleep? You know why people get sick? You know why people take the Lord's Supper so flippantly? They've not discerned who Jesus is. He died for you, sir. He died for you, ma'am. He shed that blood for you. There's, hey, there's no sports hero that did that. There's no movie star that did that. I never get that testimony of that Navajo girl who married a preacher. She stood up in front of a bunch of youth one day and said, began to give her testimony. And big old tears water up into her eyes, began to flow down her cheeks. As she said, her family had a hard time with her getting saved. But she said, but no medicine man ever died for me. No medicine man ever died for me. She couldn't get over him. Woo! Nobody like him's ever died for me. Ah, the Lord's Supper. This is an amazing table, isn't it? It's a picture of his binding blood. The third thing, notice in verse 26, it says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. It's a remembrance of his blessed bond. Not only his broken body and binding blood, but his blessed bond. You know what God's Son has given us as a promise? That he's coming back. Listen to this verse right here. This is an amazing verse. In Luke, chapter number 22, before the Lord, or right when the Lord's Supper was taking place, the Bible said in verse number 13, And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Verse 15, notice this phrase. And he said unto them, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you.
you know, it's just amazing that he loves us. I wanted to get to the next verse. I hadn't even thought about this verse, but I got words boxed in and just reading it with you again. To think that Jesus Christ said to his disciples. With desire. I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I'm just no good to him. He's lovely and I'm unlovely. <laughs> I fail him all the time and he never fails me. And Jesus never spoke words on accident. He purposely looked them over in his, their eyes and we can see the eyes of Christ today as He said, with desire. I thought this is one of the hardest moments of your life. Aren't you about to go down and fall on your face in agony, almost die, and angels strengthen you, and you say, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless thy will? And yet at the same time, He has such a passion for you and me. Wow. He's about to give the Lord's Supper. And then verse 16, he says, For I say unto you, I will not eat any more, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. When you search the scriptures, you find that there's an institution of some meals. You find in the book of Exodus, the Passover meal. Representation of the Lord Jesus Christ passing over as he sees the blood. <laughs> The death angel passes over when it sees the blood and Christ's blood sets us free. The next meal that's instituted is this one we just read. They met for Passover and now the Lord is going to give them a new one. It's the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. Because no longer are they shedding the animal's blood. It's Him that's going to shed His blood and it's going to be over. And then there's one more meal that He promises us. You read it in the book of Revelation. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. He says, I'm not going to do this again with you until then. You know, every time we do the Lord's Supper, we're reminded He's coming back. Amen. He's coming back. We're reminded we're going to sit one day with Him again. And we're going to experience a new supper. One where the Lamb of God is not going to be slain, but... Where is he? It's the Lamb. I'd like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Have you discerned the body of the Lord today? Have you gotten a better picture of Him who paid it all? I'm going to ask the pianist to play Jesus paid it all. I wonder if there would be somebody in here that you say, Preacher, if I was to die, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I've been saved. I don't know if I could take the Lord's Supper. If I died right now, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Have you had your sins forgiven? Have you been saved by the crucified one? I was 12 years old when I heard the gospel preached. I got under conviction. I didn't care who was beside me. I went forward and I asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. It was the greatest day of my life. Let me ask you, sir, ma'am, have you ever done that? If you died right now, are you going to heaven? I'm not going to embarrass you, but God knows I want to pray for you. If you say, preacher, that's me. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that today? I don't know if I'm going to heaven. You pray for me, preacher. Amen. Let me ask you this question. 
Christian, have you discerned our Lord's body? Are you living a life of hypocrisy? Do you have your parts and your deep, dark secrets where you've told God no? Have you rebelled against the Lord? My life? I'll live it a little bit, but I'm not living it all. I want my life. Is there something today? Have you discerned the Lord's body? How can we get a glimpse of Calvary and not get humbled enough to say all to Jesus I surrender? I'm going to pray when I say amen. We're going to stand up. The piano's going to start playing. Jesus paid it all. We're not going to sing yet. If the Holy Spirit's dealt with your heart, I want to invite you down to the altar to love on Him. Maybe that's all you want to do. You just want to come down and say thank you, God. I'm just convicted. I've heard one person say, if we ever take the Lord's Supper right, we'll have revival in the church. There might be some truth to that. And Lord, I pray you take our lives all to Jesus. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand up. As soon as you hear the tune, why don't you go to the altar? You go on. God's touched your heart. You know what it is? That we just want to love on Him. He's so worthy. We'll get to heaven and kneel down. It's not a bad thing to do right now. He's so worthy, the Lamb of God. John said, I looked for the Lamb. I mean, the Lion, and behold, the Lamb. <laughs> the Lamb stood in the midst of them. God's touch your heart. Why don't you come on down? Have you discerned the body yet? Have you discerned the body of our Lord Jesus? Poor page. Yeah, we're going to say 157. While people are praying, 157, while people are praying, let's sing it out on the first. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Find in me the Lord. Sing it out now. Jesus paid it all. There's snow on that second word. Lord, now indeed I find thy grip alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Yes, he can. Jesus paid it oh, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Let's sing this third verse without the instrumental. Just a cappella. What a great verse this is. Page 157. Sing this third verse on the fourth piano. You come back in. Here we go now. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I wash my garments white. In the blood of Calvary's Lamb, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. On the fourth verse, and uh, men help me with the Lord's Supper, if you'll come on down. And when before the throne, I step complete. Jesus died my soul to save. You'll just stand to the sides for a moment. To repeat. 
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we have the Lord's Supper, I always announce qualifications to take it. There are three that I want to tell you about. Number one, you have to be saved. If you're not saved, then get saved. Number two, you have to follow Lord and Believer's baptism of a church of like faith. And if you've not done that, then I want to encourage you to do it. And uh, just tell me the day. You know, we'll do it. Um, and then number three, you have to be a member of this church or a church of like faith. And so we practice, if you are a member of a church of like faith, and then we welcome you to worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us in discerning who he is. And uh, so at this time, the pedal's going to play. The cup will come by. On the top will be the juice, the bottom is the bread. And don't open it until I come back. I'm going to read a verse, and we'll do the bread, a verse, and then the uh, uh, grape juice, and then I'll pray with you. All right? You think about the Lord. Discern him. He's wonderful. And gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Thank you, Lord.
And let us pray. Father, thank you again for your darling. You gave your very best when you gave redemption. Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior. And I do worship you today. Thank you, Lord. Help us as we continue this and to remember who you are. We love you. Bless now. In Jesus' name.